BB, thank you very much for joining us today. Before we begin, tell us about your firm, Fast Markets. Where's the firm based and what services does it offer? Thanks so much for having me, Jimmy. It's always great to be on your channel. Um, yeah, so Fast Markets, we're predominantly a price reporting agency. So pricing a whole string of commodities uh, in, in a vast array of different industries. Um, from my perspective, I'm on the battery raw materials team, and that's in a research team where we produce long term forecasts looking out on the key battery metals and then all other aspects of the battery. So battery cost modeling, cost curve modeling, battery recycling. So end to end full analysis. Um, and we pair that with our in-house editorial team who produce the global leading prices for lithium, nickel, cobalt. Um, so really kind of a full spectrum of the battery world from top to bottom. And it's it's a really great place to be. And we just came off of our conference in Amsterdam where we discussed a lot of battery related content, which I'll probably bring up in the next kind of 20 minutes or so. And I'm glad you brought up that conference in Amsterdam. Maybe you can give us a little bit of context. What was the theme of the conference and how many people showed up? Yeah, so it was our Europe Battery Raw Materials Conference. So very much based in the conversations around Europe's issues, how we tackle those issues and the kind of uh, facilitating cross industry collaboration. So we had actors from across the supply chain starting in the upstream with the likes of Albemarle, you know, your global leading lithium producers, uh, nickel producers, cobalt producers, down to the midstream processors, manufacturers, battery manufacturers as well, like your CATLs, and then down into the downstream, so Volvo, uh, Mercedes, Daimler, uh, the whole host of the people acting in the sphere were there. Um, and yeah, we were discussing all the issues going on in Europe right now. So the you know complexities of regulation, uh, the lack of upstream supply, these are all issues that we were touching on on a long term forecast. So it was great to kind of be able to engage with clients on that and try and get to the bottom of some of those issues. And Phoebe, the big driver behind lithium demand is the growth in EVs and 10 million EVs were sold globally in the year 2022. What is Fast Markets projecting for EV sales in 2023? Yeah, so last year was a great year. This year, we're looking at 14.9 million EVs being sold. And that sounds like a great number, and it is. But if we look at year-on-year -year growth rates uh, for this year compared to the last, we're expecting 32% year-on-year growth this year, which is a lot slower than 2022, which was around 54%, and the year prior in 2021, which was 104%. So continuing that kind of strong growth, but not at the same level as previously. And that's largely due to some kind of slowing momentum in China, where we've seen a real sluggishness in that market due to kind of a string of factors, mostly macroeconomic in nature, um, but also a real saturation of the market there with EVs and a lack of affordability for consumers in different regions of China. So there's some kind of structural issues there, which I'm sure we can go on to in more detail later in our conversation. Um, but yeah, all in all, kind of we're seeing some cracks emerge, some structural issues that I think as an industry, we're trying to engage with and make sure that we can tackle further down the decade. And when you talk about 10 million or 15 million EV sales, it sounds like a lot. But when you look at it as a percentage of overall sales of cars, what percentage would it be? Yeah, so this year with 14.9 million EVs, that would be around 20% EV penetration, aka 20% of total vehicle sales. That would be up from 15% last year. So it's a fair amount. You know, it's not uh, a third as of yet, but I think we'll get there in the next couple of years. I think what's more indicative is if we look at EV penetration rates across different regions. So in China this year, for example, we're expecting it to reach 34% of EV penetration rate. Europe, we're expecting 30%. US, 9%. Bit of a more nascent market there, but fast emerging. And I think what those three regions highlight as the most fast moving, kind of largest consumer markets is that EVs are surging very quickly in consumers' minds as being a popular item to purchase. And secondly, what those numbers are also showcasing is that we're passing the tipping point um, for EVs being consumed. And we largely argue in the industry that that's a 5% EV penetration mark. 
And that's because if we look historically at markets that have been quick to emerge as um, countries for fast EV adoption, we see the 5% EV penetration mark as kind of the beginning of, a, of an S curve, so exponential growth. And that's mostly due to the fact that EVs are around more often, so consumers build and their confidence as them as a transport vehicle. But it's also that um, historically we've seen that EVs then move away from the niche kind of edge of the market and become very much more kind of consumed across different consumer types. So with all those regions surpassing that 5%, it's a really exciting time. And I think we're going to see exponential growth across a lot of different countries over the next two years. And Phoebe, when it comes to adoption of EVs, one of the things that prevents me from acquiring one has to do with the range and also the lack of charging stations. And living in a cold climate, it does have a negative impact on the charge. EVs work very well in Florida or California, but not so well in a cold climate. So maybe you can just talk about that and how the lack of charging station in, a, in conjunction with a short range has negatively impacted the sale of or adoption of EVs. Yeah, I think the biggest thing to highlight there is um, charging point infrastructure as the main barrier. Um, cell technological development is fast evolving. And I, I think that in terms of a range concern is not actually the problem. And I think that's the adjustment that needs to take place in people's minds. It's not range anxiety, it's charge anxiety. It's that fear, right? Like you've just said, Jimmy, that you're not gonna find a charging point in the rural areas of Canada where you go skiing or in the rural areas of the UK where I am if I'm going on a trip somewhere. So really the issue there is ensuring that there's the right policy, the right incentives and the right financial support to build that network. And what I included in my demonstration in Amsterdam was um, some kind of research I've done to show the countries in the world that are the most advanced and the least advanced in building that infrastructure. And we can do that by creating a simple EV fleet to charging point ratio. So what it showcases is that at the bottom of the pile, we have the US with a 49 EVs to one public charging point ratio compared to your South Korea's or China where they've got two to one and three to one. And typically why that 49 to one is not that great is because we argue that a 10 to one ratio is kind of the basic necessity uh, for two things to happen. Number one, to actively support your current fleet, but also to embolden people's confidence in the market to purchase an EV because they're around, they can see public charging points and their charge anxiety reduces. So that's the kind of real fraction or fracture, should we say, right now in the market, I think that's the area where consumers have the least confidence and that really needs to be ameliorated because on the technological side for sales, that is quick advancing and we're seeing, you know, sales coming out of China that have over a thousand kilometers in range, for example, if we're referencing Goshen sales. So yeah, I think the charging point is a real sticking point for us right now. And why don't you just expand on that? When it comes to lithium ion batteries, there's two primary types, NCM and LFP. What's the difference between the two and which one is more dominant and why? Yeah, it's it's funny. These two kind of emerged as um, the kind of lead competitors in the market. If I just kind of explain the differences and, and why they're going head to head. So LFP, it's a lithium ion phosphate cell. Typically, it has a lower energy density because it can have around 150 to 170 watts per kilogram. Um, and however, it's kind of a lower cost because it's lithium ion and phosphate. If we compare that to NCM, we're looking at nickel, cobalt, manganese. The inclusion of cobalt makes it a bit more expensive. However, that nickel and cobalt partnership give it, gives it a bigger energy density with around 220 watts per kilogram. So that's kind of giving you a range of 400 to 600 kilometers. And so that range is making NCM far more popular in markets like the US, those in Europe, where consumers perceive a need to have a vehicle that can travel, you know, that 600 kilometers. Um, and by contrast, we're seeing LFP being manufactured and consumed in China quite a lot. So you're getting around, if we take kind of the Tesla Model 3 as an example, 430 kilometers of range, so a bit shorter. The thing that I think will change with time um, is that consumers will become aware that they actually don't need that much range in their vehicles. So research has shown that 
99% of users in the UK uh, actually use uh, less than 160 kilometers in total drives kind of in a car in the year. And then the average trip in the US is in 94% of cases also below 80 kilometers. And I think that gives a sense actually as to the reality of the car that you need. And I think with time, consumers will realize that and be more comfortable with having an LFP battery in their car with a lower range as a result. But for now, if I just give you our forecast, um, in 2033, we're expecting NCM to be the more dominant in EVs with 48% of the market. Um, LFP is going to have uh, just a little bit below that with around 40%. But I think with time, LFP will kind of overgrow NCM as those changes in the consumer world kind of take place. So LFP in our minds is, is really where the growth rates is at, but NCM will still be around to play. So we spent some time on EVs, but you have also done a lot of work on energy storage systems. What is energy storage and how is it driving battery demand? Yeah, so to give a kind of broad definition, energy storage is where you use um, technology to store and harness energy from the grid, and then you expend it at another time when you need that energy. So historically, that's been done with hydropower, where you use water from different heights to propel a wheel and generate power. Um, and hydropower has been around since the 19th century, so nothing really new there. Um, but now the we're in the era of battery energy storage. So that's where you use a battery to store energy from the grid and then expel it at another time for a variety of use cases. Um, it could either be the main ones or one of two. So the first is frequency regulation where um, issues with the grid, they'll use batteries to store or expel energy to balance that out. And then secondly, and why we're seeing it become super popular, is the arrival of renewable energy. Renewable energy creates a lot of peaks and troughs in terms of power generation. And what batteries can do is they can store the energy at those kind of peak times and expend it at times when it's lower. So if you take solar, that would be at night. Um, and we're also seeing markets kind of realize this and understand the capacities that batteries pose to their grids and their renewable energy. And so if we take the US and China, we're seeing an explosion of policy, um, which is really seeking to increase the amount of batteries in their markets. So the US with the IRA, um, incredibly lucrative tax credits, reaching 70% of the tax credit for ESS products. Um, and that's made investors really keen on pursuing ESS projects there. And then in China, we're seeing more of a stick than a carrot approach. Um, enforcing that of all renewable energy products, 10 to 15 percent have to be supported by a battery. So policy really leading the way there, but also the private sector coming up with the likes of the IRA creating the kind of lucrative nature of ESS. So um, a really exciting market. I would frame it all by saying, though, that it's only 7 percent of battery demand globally right now. It's going to reach 15 percent by 2033 but it is much smaller than the EV segment. So we'll still see that world, shall we say, kind of take the lion's share for battery demand. Phoebe, we can't have a discussion on EVs and lithium ion batteries without discussing China. And you touched on this earlier, but it is the largest market in the world. And maybe you can just tell us what's happening in China in terms of the economy and also the impact that is having on the growth in EVs and also lithium ion batteries. Yeah, I mean, we're all reading about it, right? Um, there's a real change going on in the Chinese market. The history of, of growth and their economic model is starting to show signs of distress. Um, and within that stress is uh, the EV segment. So historically, you know, we've seen year on year growth rates of 100 percent and over. And this year, you know, we're seeing month on month um, sorry, year on year growth on a monthly sense of around 30 to 40 percent. So it is slowing down. And if we take Q1, you know, in January, we saw sales uh, actually negatively contract by 5.5 percent. Um, so a real sluggishness there. And as we've said, kind of due to macroeconomic factors, um, but also there's kind of a saturation of consumers who can afford EVs now have bought them. Uh, we're actually seeing a rise in plug-in hybrids as a result because those are people in more rural areas who are seeking an EV that works for them in their location. 
So there needs to be an improvement of charging there. And also, um, you know, we're just not seeing the kind of growth rates because of the lack of affordability. Um, more generally, you know, China's consumer market is much more variable in terms of average monthly income, particularly in rural areas. So we need EVs to get a little bit cheaper as well. So we'll see that happen. But until then, um, the market is sluggish. And as a result, global sales are a bit slower. And as a result of that, lithium prices and lithium demand for this year is also a lot slower. So it's very much a China story. So let's expand on that and let's put all these two factors together. The EV adoption rate is growing, but we have an economic slowdown in China. What are these two factors, or I should say, how are these two factors impacting the lithium price? Yeah, we've seen real sluggishness this year. So if I give you some figures using our fast markets, um, LCE, so that's lithium carbonate price in China. You know, we saw over 590,000 yuan per ton in price last December. We're now at 200,000. So, you know, a drop of over, you know, 70% there, um, which is pretty severe given the highs in Q4 last year. So what we've seen really, um, in addition to that volatility is, in addition to that volatility, sorry, is consolidation. And what I mean by that is this 200,000 yuan per ton has really demonstrated to us where supply really is. Um, last year, there wasn't enough, and that's why the prices were so volatile in terms of upward trajectory. This year, China has kind of got overcapacity and oversupply across the supply chain. So I mean, lithium, um, also batteries and EVs. And why that's showing in the lithium price is because that means that there's a lot in the market and we just aren't consuming enough of that stuff, essentially. And so what we're hearing from the pedal light producers is that they're actually starting to turn off the taps at 200,000 yuan per ton. And that signals to us that that's kind of a base price that's needed in the market before it starts to eat into profit margins. So going forward over the next couple of years, we would expect that as a base price over the longer term. As more supply continues to come online, that price will continue to trend down. Having said that, there will always be volatility, there will always be black swan events. And so I think it's needless to say that there's a strong likelihood that that price could go up again. But I think in Q4, we'll see a little bit of price surge because of Q4 seasonality in China. We tend to see EV sales go up. But if we're talking about severe volatility in the near or long term, we're not going to see anything like we saw in Q4 last year. Phoebe, as we wrap up, Fast Markets is always organizing amazing events. Maybe you can tell us what events are coming up in the next few months. Yeah, we've got a ton. Our events team are incredibly busy. So first one is a webinar that my team are doing to kind of look at this year and look at the year ahead and try and dispel some of the chaos and, um, yeah, explain to our clients what we're saying for the near and long term. So I'd advise everybody to tune in for that. But in terms of physical events, um, we've got our China's Shanghai conference December 6th and 7th. And then next year, we'll have our usual kind of lineup of our Asia conference in Seoul, which is super exciting, going to be my first time there in May, June. And then we're going to go back to Vegas for our kind of flagship lithium event, which had over a thousand delegates this year. So really, really excited to attend all of those. And anybody watching who wants to reach out or come, please do message me on LinkedIn or get in touch. It'd be really great to have you there. Well, this is one of the great things about your job, Phoebe, is that you get to travel the world and meet many yeah. interesting people best traveling i've ever done i love it strongly advise working in the, the battery world <laughs> well phoebe thank you very much for spending time with us today and sharing your insights on what's happening within the lithium ion battery space once again thank you thanks so much jimmy always great to chat